If you asked me to name the best looking electric car on sale today, I'd probably say the Honda E, though the Hyundai Ioniq 5 sure is lovely too. You know who else clearly loves the look of the Honda E? Designers at Volkswagen, because wow, there's some hardcore parallel evolution stuff going on with the looks of the Honda E and the newly unveiled VW ID Life concept shown at the IAA Mobility 2021 Motor Show in Munich. Which, to be fair, means that I think the ID Life is a pretty good looking vehicle. I could even forgive VW for making it yet another damn crossover, though why designers thought it needed 7.5 inches of ground clearance is absolutely beyond me. The ID. Life, which unfortunately shares its name with a line of vitamin supplements sold through a multi level marketing scheme, RIP my Google search suggestions, is a compact electric crossover concept built on a pared down version of the Volkswagen MEB platform that underpins the ID3, ID4, ID6, Cooper Born, Audi Q4 e-tron, and Skoda Enyaq, to name a few. The concept, which we're told will enter into production in 2025, features a 57 kilowatt hour usable battery, a 234 horsepower, 172 kilowatt motor, which for the first time on an MEB car drives the front wheels instead of the rear, and a WLTP range of about 250 miles, 400 kilometers, which I'm guessing means a more real world range closer to around 190 miles, 306 kilometers. According to VW, the concept dispenses with any quote, decorative or add-on elements, which makes some sense for a car that the company plans to sell for a starting price of €20,000 or about US dollars That puts its price under that of the 2021 VW e-up, which is currently one of the cheapest EVs on the market in Europe. There are some interesting and odd features to the ID Life, such as the use of smartphone integration in place of navigation, which I think makes sense a steering yoke instead of a steering wheel, which I think makes no sense, and the sort of innovative, flexible seating that every concept car seems to have, but which never makes it into production because crash tests are a thing that cars have to pass. But I'm not going to go into all those details, because it is still a concept car. Instead, I want to talk about how this car makes me feel, and what significance it has in the EV market. Here's the thing. The VW ID Life pisses me off. Seriously. First of all, I highly doubt we'll see the ID Life in North America, though the fact that VW chose to gratuitously make the thing a crossover does imply that a US market launch is at least on its radar, since everyone knows that you can't sell anything but crossovers, SUVs, and trucks here. But it's not the fact that I'm unlikely to be able to buy one of these things that gets my dander up. It's the fact that this is a car which, at one point, would have rocked the EV world. But now, meh? To understand where I'm coming from, let's go back in time for a moment. In the 1930s, leadership in Germany, yes, the leadership you're thinking of, wanted a cheap, mass-produced vehicle to bring mobility to the masses. Ferdinand Porsche and a team of designers created a car that met the requirements set out for such a vehicle, and in the late 30s the first of what would come to be the VW Beetle were produced. For a variety of reasons, mostly involving war and genocide, mass production of what at the time was just known as a Type 1 or just the Volkswagen wouldn't really become a thing until the late 1940s, thanks in no small part to the British Army. Popularity and production ramped up dramatically over the next couple of decades, as millions of people around the world chose to drive the diminutive VW. I love classic bugs, and have owned four of them as daily drivers over the last 20 years, but let's not beat around the bush. The Beetle was a no-frills econo-box… econo-hump? Whatever. Volkswagen's brilliant marketing even made a point of the fact that there were pretty much no options available for the little car. You got four wheels, an anemic but fuel efficient and comparatively low maintenance engine, a radio, though for many years that was the one optional extra, a heater that sort of worked, windshield wipers, brakes, and sometimes an electric rear window defroster. The Beetle was everything you need in a car and nothing else. But what you got in exchange was a cheap sticker price, low insurance rates, and during the fuel crisis you could laugh at your friends in their V8s waiting in endless lines for petrol. When Volkswagen finally embraced water cooling and front wheel drive with the Golf Mark 1, a car whose lines the ID Life almost calls to mind, though not as much as the Honda E does, weirdly enough, it kept the same formula as the Bugs. It offered a cheap, reliable, economic option for people who didn't want luxury or performance. 
That said, when the Golf GTI hit the market, VW finally had a performance option for people who wanted to pay extra for some excitement. The VW Type 1 or VW Beetle was a radical car, built to fill a specific need that was vitally important to the development of our modern world. Not since the Model T had a car designed with accessibility so clearly in mind become so wildly successful, and without the Beetle, and the cars it influenced or competed with, our modern world wouldn't exist as it does today. There's a whole conversation to be had about if that was a good thing or not, given where we are now with anthropogenic climate change and sprawl, but that's not the conversation at hand. The Western world and its transportation needs were changing radically in the mid-20th century, and Volkswagen was there to help make it happen. Now, there's no question that we once again have been faced with the need to make radical changes, as we seek to decarbonise our mobility needs. The ID Life concept is exactly what the moment calls for if the moment in question is more than a decade ago. And this is not the first time, or even the first time this month, that I, or Nikki, or Kate, or Erin, or anyone else associated with the channel has looked at a car and gone, YAY! 2010 called and they want their car back! A sub $25,000 highway capable EV with over 150 miles of range? This is a vehicle that could have made an enormous difference if it had been available back when Volkswagen was still flogging its so-called clean diesel cars while knowingly lying about spewing huge quantities of pollutants into the atmosphere. It could have been the successor to the VW Beetle, a ubiquitous, cheap, perfectly fine car that got people from point A to point B in a modicum of comfort and without any emissions. Don't get me wrong, the ID Life is still the car we need today, but I don't think it'll have the impact it once could have, and that's because we've all become obsessed about the things this car doesn't win at. The EV market today cares about two things, range and 0-60 to 60 times. Instead of growing out of lower cost and lower expectation cars, the modern EV world was built by Tesla, which took the opposite approach, starting with big, premium, high-performance cars that could win big spenders away from their petrol cars into something that was frankly better than what they had. I'm not crapping on Tesla here. It drove EV adoption forward at a time when most mainstream automakers couldn't be bothered to do so. The EV world today, including my job, might well not be here without Tesla's impact on the market. But when automakers did start getting in gear, they chased Tesla's success, and along the way, consumers came to feel that the only cars worth owning were ones with multiple hundreds of miles of range and acceleration that can melt your face off. You never hear the adage about it being more fun to drive a slow car fast than a fast car slow in the EV world. I complain endlessly about the move to big cars and crossovers, but in the electrical vehicle space, that is a no small part about the insistence that our modern cars need 300 miles of range to be worth considering, and big batteries need big chassis. And here's the thing, at the prices we see for EVs, I get it. I love the idea of the Honda e, but even I think it's too expensive for the range you get for the money. Not that my opinion matters, because you can't buy one in the States. I drive a kind of crappy little car with 70-ish miles of range that cost me less than $4,000. More on that in a future video. I thought about a new Mini SE, but I didn't want to spend 30 grand on a car with less than 120 miles of range. Though I'd have been there all day at 160 miles, especially if it had better DC fast charging than it does. Though the Mini's awful efficiency was an issue for me too. Every time we say something to this effect, people get upset. But reality is that for a huge number of people's needs, 150 miles or so of range is just fine, especially when paired with good DC fast charging. Is that true for everyone? Absolutely not, especially in places like the US Midwest. But lots of cars aren't suitable for every user or every market. Keep in mind though that more than 98 million people live in urban areas where a smaller, versatile car would be a better fit than a massive SUV. And 175 million live in suburbia, where more range is required but far less than many would have you believe, especially with the expansion of DC fast charging infrastructure. All this has a lot to do with car culture in the US, the mythology surrounding our in-state highway system, and the idea you should always be able to jump in a car and just drive. Anywhere. Anytime. Here's the thing. Back when I drove ICE cars, I'd have absolutely loved a Mazda MX-5 Miata or a Toyota 86, but living in a place with tons of heavy snow, a rear-wheel drive, low-to-the-ground sports car wasn't feasible for me. That doesn't make those cars bad, just not suitable for my needs. 
I figure about half the population of the USA, and more than half the population of Europe would do fine with a 150 mile range car, but having tons of range has become a status and convenience thing, much like a V6 and V8 engines are in the internal combustion engine world, where a huge percent of owners don't need the horsepower or torque those engines offer, but want it anyway because among other things, that VH badge carries a certain social cachet. It's going to take Volkswagen four more years to bring the ID life to market. That's four more years of no options for cheap EVs in the US, and limited options elsewhere outside the Chinese market. And no, I don't think that the promised $25,000 Tesla, of which we've yet to see a single render, prototype or spec sheet, will be on the market before the ID life is. There's a reason Tesla hasn't held a reveal event or opened the order books for that car, which as far as I know, Tesla hasn't even confirmed will be called the Model 2. Tesla has all the demand it can handle with the models it already has, not to mention customers waiting eagerly for the Roadster 2.0 and the Cybertruck to enter into production. The company is opening new factories for cars and batteries as quickly as it can, but even so, it'll be quite a while before it makes financial sense to divert resources to a car that won't make the company nearly as much money as its higher ticket models do. From the perspective of transitioning the world away from fossil fuels as fast as possible, it might make sense to stop Model S, X, and or Cybertruck production to focus on the cheap car, but Tesla has made it clear that it is, first and foremost, a business and needs to look after its shareholders' interest. Recent comments from Tesla that the small car will not have a steering wheel or pedals further makes me think that the commenters assuring me it'll be in a driveway in 18 months are in for some disappointment. Even if Tesla has solved the technical issues, which I'm not convinced of yet, the legislative hurdles to getting a private vehicle without manual controls to market are significant. I'd love to be wrong though. I can't help it. I'm an automotive journalist, which is still a weird thing to say, and I love small cars. I want the modern EV equivalent of the VW Beetle, and because of that, I can't help but be kind of excited by the ID life. But it's the car the market and the environment needed a decade ago. Today, I'm not so sure it has what it takes. And it isn't available today, or even tomorrow, it's still years away. By then, I think small, affordable EVs are going to be dominated by Chinese automakers, if they can break into the European and American markets. And who knows, maybe Japan will surprise us with something that isn't a big SUV. But I doubt it. The best time for the ID life to hit the market was 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. But by 2025, will it still be the best time? I guess we'll have to wait and wait to see. That's it for today. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and our other two channels, Transport Evolve Take Two and Transport Evolve Shorts. We know that while a fair few of you are already subscribed, many more aren't. So go on, hit the bell and help us out. Let us know below what you thought of this video, and if you're not someone who likes the YouTube comment section, because who does, then why not continue this on our Discord server? It's free and we'll leave the link below. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew grab to the folk on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, David Janakula, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahada, Brophy Wolf, Tesla Nagong, Paul Conway, Sean Ueda, Gordon C, Regine Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Kyle Hodson, Anthony Coates, Laura Sanborn, Rory Litwin, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month patron supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of our wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. And of course, you can also buy your very own tea swag at a Redbubble store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!